Ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. You're listening to the Deal Room Podcast. Join us as we bring you the inside scoop on business sales and acquisitions. Get across trends in the area and hear the industry's best recount their real life tips, traps, and experiences. Now, here's your host, Joanna Oki. Hi, it's Joanna Oki here, and you're listening to the Deal Room Podcast, a podcast proudly brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. Now, today we have part one of a two part series all about acquisitions for growth. Now, in this episode, we look at why you would bother acquiring for growth if three out of four acquisitions fail. And in the next episode, we're going to be talking about a more positive light on acquisitions, how you make sure that your acquisition is the one out of four that is a success. So today, to talk about this, we have on board Mark Johnston from Sherlaw's Group. Mark is an absolute powerhouse of information. And in this episode, we really drill into what it is that make acquisitions fail and what the statistics are saying about it all. This is a fabulous episode. I hope you enjoy listening to it as much as I enjoyed recording it. Well, here we go with Mark. Mark, thank you for coming on to the Deal Room podcast again. It's fabulous having you on uh, for a second time. My pleasure. And thank you again, Joanna and your team. And uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on which <laughs> time of the day. You're when listening. it is you're listening to this, that's it. That's the beauty of podcasting. It could be any time all over the globe. Um, actually, interestingly, we do have random listeners from all over the mm. globe. So who knows where you are, but good morning, afternoon to you. That yes, that's maybe it. my second cousins somewhere around the world. <laughs> Uh, now, Mark, I wanted to have you back on again because I really, really enjoyed um, our first discussion in our show notes. I can't even remember what what the number was of the podcast episode. So if you're listening in now, um, make sure after you've listened to this episode, you go check out the show notes because we'll be linking straight through to the other podcast um, that uh, Mark and I chatted on. But today we're talking all about the concept of um, growth via acquisition. So acquisition is an alternative to um, organic um, growth. Um, so, Mark, why are we talking about this? Why um, are acquisitions? And maybe just quickly for people who um, haven't listened to the first episode or, or um, maybe have forgotten, how about you just give us a quick rundown of um, who you are in your background? Yeah, look, great. Th- thank you. Joan, look, our company, uh, Sherlaw's Group, we uh, advise SMEs on how to grow their companies. Um, either organically or via acquisition because you know when you think of growth um, you know acquisition is one mode or one opportunity but there are also other ways in which a company can grow its revenue and its share price and, and one of those is organic so we work with uh, SMEs and their advisors so we work closely with their lawyers and their accountants um, and their uh, financial advisors as well to actually uh, um, identify what is the right growth path you know is it a combination of organic and acquisition, acquisition only or organic. And one of the first things we, you know, we start with is, uh, is a statistic uh, from the mid-market, which was a study McKinsey and Company did in the 1980s, which identified that 77% of mergers and acquisitions fail. So if we just start with a why are you doing this when yeah. three out of four deals don't work, yeah. And it's not because the McKinsey guys or, you know, or the accountant or the business got the spreadsheets wrong. You know, when you're looking to merge two companies or one company to acquire a number, you know, a lot of times right is correctly spent on doing the numbers mm. to make sure you get the benefits of that. Mm. But what, they, what the study found was the two main impediments to a successful um, acquisition were actually mer- you know, merging the cultures. If, two, you know, if one company acquires another, actually the, the cultural changes and paying attention to that um, because, you know, obviously the, the, the different cultures or the DNAs of businesses aren't typically, they don't typically show up in the spreadsheet. Mm-hmm. Um, so paying attention to that. So culture is really important. And also the time. And, 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 it's, and that's the time to have the deal work because if mm-hmm. you don't give an acquisition enough time to be successful, well, you don't get the returns. So if you're looking for a, you know, a 200% share price increase as a return, well, if that's going to take three years, but you've only got the cash flow or the capital for 18 months to do it, well, you don't get the opportunity doesn't get baked in enough. So the two main reasons were culture and time. 
But if we just step back from that and say, well, three out of four acquisitions or mergers don't actually work, why are we doing this and what are the other alternatives? So, so and before we look at that question, can I, can I just dig into what it means for an acquisition to not work, in inverted commas, to fail? Because I, you know, I hear lots of figures bandied about and I'm always interested in the concept of well, what does fail versus success mm. mean? And, and I, I look at that. And I ask that because so many businesses we deal with initially might come in without a clear picture of what success or failure means at at the end of the day as well. So, you know, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, firstly, that's that's a great question, uh, Joanna, because uh, it's actually not particularly well articulated. So Mm. quite often we'll see, well, we'll we'll make one plus one equal four. So two companies will, a company will acquire another company and those two entities, you know, one being one each, will make one plus one equal four. But what we often see is that that one one plus one only equals 1.2 because Mm. it takes too long to embed. The staff turnover is a critical issue that leads to um, failure. Customers go away as well, so staff turnover happens. Customers leave because they don't like the the new acquiring entity, et cetera, et cetera. They may have conflicts. So what people don't articulate um, accurately is success. They kind of have an idea of it, and it's typically numbers-based. But they don't typically have, you know, um, KPIs around, yeah. you know, staff turnover, all the other, yeah. you know, customer retention. But you know, to, but where your question is really prescient is they don't actually don't articulate failure well. Which is mm. at what point will we know that this isn't going to work? And what's our plan B? What's our mm. parachute option if it doesn't work? Um, because ultimately, uh, w- without you know strong corporate governance, i.e., at the at the board level, but also at the advisory board level, and at the advisor level by actually not introducing failure. So one of the things we'll do with a, with a client is actually talk about failure in advance of the deal happening because it's much easier to talk about, you know, the, the failure milestones of if we don't get the returns at six months or at this point, we don't get that milestone-based return, what is our plan B? What's our parachute option to mm. keep the business? Because ultimately the key to successful business is to stay in business. Mm. And if you're at risk of failing, um, you know, the, that, that you know that means all the hard work from all the the folks in the company you know comes to nothing. So it's really important to articulate failure in advance because when you're actually failing, it's much harder to have a grounded yes station without the heat of we're yeah. Failing. So yeah. it's like if you were on an airplane today um, and you know a red light went off, you would hope your pilot is trained to re- respond a certain way. Yeah, and I use that word respond because. You know, a pilot is trained to respond a certain way if something happens, it's just like a surgeon is. What we often see in business is a red light goes off or something happens and we panic. We haven't, we react to it, we don't respond mm. and say, Oh, this is going on. We didn't anticipate this. And we, you know, we go into a frantic mode of what do we do? And we typically, you know, we use phrases like we'll circle the wagons and all that co- corporate sort of bingo terminology mm. that we call it. And what it actually doesn't, what it just creates is that continue, continuation of spinning of the wheels. Mm. So actually articulating what failure looks like mm. um, critically, you know, is important because when we can see those potential failures occurring, you know, in the next three to six months, we can actually take proactive actions to address those we can typically, you know, maybe tap more capital, get more debt. But once, you know, it's six months down the track and that red light's flashing really strongly, it's hard to get investment. You know, you do what's typically called a down round in Silicon Valley, which is you raise money at a value lower than you did last time or you raise money at a value lower than what you think the company's worth or you get, you know, you have to get debt at, mm. at a much higher price so that, you know, it's a couple, 200, 300 basis points above us, you know, what you can afford. And, you know, we just think of, you know, Australia's just gone into a recession uh, this week. And back, you know, in 1990, the prime interest rate was 21%. Mm. What that meant is if you're a company and you've got debt, you know, 25% of that was, you know, that, that was the interest rate. So if your mm. margin was 30% as a company, you were paying 25% of that to wow. the bank first before you could run your business. So the impacts of that... Um, mean that we actually don't articulate failure. And, mm. and one of the other um, problems we have in Australia is, you know, uh, you know in the United States, uh, failure is seen as a badge of honour. 
It's, you know, you, you learned your lessons on someone else's dime. You showed resilience, you stayed in the game. So if you talk about a failure you had in a company or in your career, that's embraced. Whereas mm. in Australia, we have a, a cultural um, mindset of not articulating failure, not embracing it. So mm. as Isn't a result, yeah, so as a re- result, we're less likely to discuss it mm. because it's, it's viewed a certain way. And we also have the legal ramifications of, you know, we don't have Chapter 11 in Australia. Mm. Um, you know, there are fiduciary duties on the board and all those sorts yeah. of things. So, you know, in Australia, if you fail, you go bankrupt and, and that's, you know, that's a significant, um, you know, impact on your future career, your ability to start companies. Yeah. Now, whereas in the United States, you've got Chapter 11 protection uh, and, the, and if you do proceed to bankruptcy or administration, your ability to come back from that is not seven years, it's three years. And it's not, mm. it's not viewed as a... It's not ideal, but as I said, it's it's viewed as a positive in that you've tried something and you've embraced it. So we don't have that cultural or legal sort of um, you know in, engagement around the concept of failure in Australia, which means we don't talk about it. Which means we're much less likely to be able to um, predict it, discuss it, and therefore rectify the situation. So yeah. you know, your, your question around, you know, identifying failure milestones or failure points, uh, you know, it, it, it is one of the most important things, you know, a, a business that's looking to sell or a business that's looking to acquire another one. And you know, one of the things we talk to, when we talk to an acquiring company, when we're doing what's called buy side due diligence on the the, um, the company they're looking to acquire is hmm. we actually look for failures. Have they actually dealt with failures in their business? You know, have they actually released a product four years ago that didn't get the returns and they nipped it in the bud after six months because that was the agreed failure point and they learned something from it or they evolved their business model? In Silicon Valley, they call it pivoting. And what yeah. pivoting means is you made a mistake and you learned something from it and you pivoted your business. Well, there's a lot of people who are learning what pivot means right at the moment, yeah. isn't there, Mark? Yeah, and, 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 and pivot, pivot's going to become one of those corporate <laughs> bingo words as well. But, mm. but ultimately, you know, those sorts of businesses, because the, you know, in, in the United States and in Silicon Valley, because they're venture capital backed, there's much greater risk on the board because the VCs are used to dealing with the requirements to pivot, things don't work, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a big enough market over there that you can, you know, evolve yourself. So that, that, um, you know, that embracing of, you know, of failure and acknowledgement. So what we look for when we're doing due diligence is actually when did they fail and how, did they deal with it? If Did they actually cut the product or the new office? So it'll be things like we released a new product or we opened a new office here or we, you know, we tried something else. And we'll actually say, well, in the strategic documents, were, was there actually a conversation around, the, as you rightly asked, what does failure look like? So few people talk about that. I just, like, what a novel perspective. Mm. I absolutely love it. It's really mm. a, a really interesting take on what you're looking for. For mm. in DD as well, you know, because quite often mm. DD can look quite mechanical, but what yeah. you're talking about here is is mm. digging further, you know. Yeah. And also, if you know, if you're the company looking to be acquired, actually leading with, or well, not leading with that, but talking about that as well, because if the business is, you know, always, you know, said so we've never made a mistake and we've always been successful, you know, they're either lucky or lying. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And neither are investable. So if we're looking to acquire a business and they've said, you know, we've never made a mistake. Well, we don't know if they're resilient. We don't know what's going to happen if they do make a mistake because the guarantee is we all make mistakes in life. Yeah, yeah um, that's and right. If they're, if they're misleading us, well, that's obviously another, you know, and but what that leads to is also ego because if people are saying we're, we've never made a mistake, you know, maybe that indicates egos in the business or mm. within the leadership team. And, again, that means the business is less valuable less likely to be resilient because what we, you know, in an ideal world, we want a successful company that, you know, has you know, for every of every five initiatives, they have four successes and one fails mm. and they deal with the failure. They learn from it. They evolve the business because, you know, innovation is in Silicon Valley where, where we spent, where I spent quite a bit of time working with VCs, you know, innovation often, you know, is re-termed failing fast and learning from it. Mm. So, you know, what they'll have is, you know, is, you know, a series of breakdowns leads to a breakthrough. So mm. if you fail in certain things, it's okay, how do we pivot out of that? So in an SME, which is a more in a more static industry and you know more competitive forces, 
what we need to look for is, as I said, those, you know, I'd much rather invest in a business that has four out of five successes, deals with failure, than someone who said they're never... But ma- maybe part of what is happening in that discussion as well. So if you're talking about four out of five successes or, or whatever, um, and, and the one failure versus the none, perhaps what you're looking at a business as well that have got more market intelligence as well, because they've been yeah. out, they're looking, testing, understanding they're better run. Yeah, they're got not- more information that it, that is mm. useful to an acquirer. Yeah. And so let's so coming full circle, so we've talked about um, this failure to identify for what failure is, um, and and fail to fail. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and um, and and part of that, I think, is always a failure to properly identify what success mm. looks like, and you know, mm. success metrics, and maybe sometimes a failure to understand, um, mm. uh, to pro- have properly understood what they what they're actually seeking to do out of that acquisition. Yes. Mm. But but let's, we, we've talked about the numbers that mm. fail. So why is it when there's such a large potential of failing, according to these studies, why is it that acquisition should still be something that businesses mm. think about? Yeah. Well, if you think about it, you know, what we're trying to do via acquisition is grow. Yeah. So, as I said, you know, in, in an ideal world for us, it's a combination of organic growth, which is how can we continue to, to you know, create growth from our existing cash flow um, and then also you know, to acquire businesses that we can then you know, ha- have an advantage of. So you know, why, it, why it typically works is firstly, if, you, if the industry you're in has activity in it. So if, you, if we go back to sort of you know, the, what I call the three lessons of acquiring, which are you know, the three lessons of Silicon Valley, which is the first thing they look for is what's happening in the industry because 98.4% of the returns come from the asset class, not the company. Mm. And, that's, you know, and that's, you know, that's the first thing you learn in finance or corporate finance at university because, you know, as an example, in Australia recently, we had the mining boom for 10 years. So the worst miner still tripled their share price because iron ore went through the roof. Such whereas a good example. You, whereas yep. if you've run a, um, a newspaper for the last 20 years, um, and you haven't moved to digital content. You're still trying to print, you know, you know, deliver print newspapers on the week during the week. It doesn't matter how good your business is; your industry is in decline, mm. which means there's less value attached to their share price. So the golden rule is what's happening in the industry, because if the industry is in growth mode, um, that's you know that's where the opportunity is, because the rising tide will lift all boats. So where acquisition can help is firstly. If that industry is in decline, well, that's when private equity enter your industry. That is a sign to start looking at aggregation or growth fire acquisition because mm. private equity's business model is to create a return within a three-year time frame. And what they typically do is buy underperforming businesses or businesses that, you know, the, the owners have hit, hit what we call the second brick wall and they're disillusioned. And they look back at the good old days and say, when we had half the staff and twice the money, with 40 people in our office at French's Forest. We now have 120 people down at Brookvale and we're not making any money. So what private equity do is typically, you know, produce, in, implement the private equity formula, which is to buy it at, you know, pennies on the pound for you, bring their guys into it, change the business around, restructure it, and then grow via acquisition. So when private equity enters the industry you're in, and you know, at, at the, the the top of the segment, if you're an SME, a couple of segments down, and you know, if we just look at every industry, for the accountants, you know, on the podcast today, you know, the 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 tier one guys are KPMG, PwC, EY, and Deloitte, and then there's the second tier guys who are um, Crow Horworth, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, BDO Seedman, and you know, there's nine of those around the world, and then there's the third tier and the fourth tier. So as soon as acquisition comes up in those first two tiers, that means there's going to be a ripple effect down to the third, fourth, and fifth tier. So that's where we talk, you know, your point um, or comment before, Joanna, around um, knowing what's happening in the industry. In Silicon Valley, they call it seeing around corners, which is actually spending time researching your industry, knowing what business you're really in, what they're buying. So where acquisition can help is, you know, when there's acquisition in the layers above you in your industry, because ultimately someone is going to then look, at this, you know, look for growth via acquisition. And if you're in an, a growth industry, the other time to really um, 
consider growth fire acquisition is when your industry is growing quickly. So mm-hmm. one of the things we talk about organic growth versus growth fire acquisition is the first baseline is what's the growth of your industry? And if the industry growth is 10%, then your performance should be adjusted against that. So if you've grown at 8%, you've actually underperformed the industry. Yeah. If you've grown at 20%, et cetera. So in our industry, which we've been in for 20 years, um, the, the business, you know, the SME coaching industry, our industry grows at 25%. And so our, our baseline is 20%. So for our first 10 years, we grew at 50% per annum, which mm. meant we were able to double the industry average. And we didn't actually grow via acquisition. We grew organically. But if you were looking to take advantage of that industry, well, when the industry has high growth rates, sometimes you can't keep up organically. So growing via acquisition, it's like the arms race or it's like a gold rush. Mm. Um, you know, if they open up a bit of land where there's gold, your job is to put as many stakes down as quickly as possible. And, mm. you know, the property developers on the call will know, you know, when you when you you know you get a, a slice of land rezoned, it's it's a foot race to get as many as you can, um, and to use debt. So when the industry has high growth, that's when you know growth via acquisition allows you to keep up and keep ahead of that. And you know you can see that in all sorts of industries. You know the the time management industry at the moment. There's a company called Kronos out of the United States um, that is uh, backed by uh, one of the large private equity firms globally, and you can just go to their website. And they have said you know, our strategy for Kronos is to grow via acquisition. So we had a client who was two tiers below Kronos who was doing $13 million revenue at the time. And we said, well, let's position ourselves for acquisition and we're able to do some certain things. We grew the business to $25 million revenue organically. Hmm. They were then able to raise $25 million at a $75 million valuation, which wow. was three times revenue and about 12 times profit purely because the, the private equity firm had publicly stated on Kronos' website, we need to, once, this is how we'll tap out the organic growth via these strategies, and then in three years' time we'll need to grow via acquisition. Yeah. So just understanding or researching your industry, understanding what's happening around you and below you and on either side of you, looking at what's happening with your competitors. And one of the things, uh, and we'll come back to that in a second, the, the competitors, but one of the things we're talking about here is the, the larger SMEs. Let's talk about the smaller SMEs. Mm. So let's talk about an SME that maybe is one or two million turnover. Mm-hmm. You know, what are these indicators of things for them as well? So, you know, at, at that size, they're not necessarily looking at taking over the market, taking over the industry, but growth via acquisition can mm. still be a really useful, can, mm. can be a useful and a quicker method mm. of getting growth than simply organic growth. What, yeah, what's uh, your thoughts for them? Yeah, look, and there's probably, um, there's two relevant case studies here. So we worked with a, um, a CBD, CBD-based accounting firm uh, that was doing $1.5 million revenue. Uh, yep. And we started we started chatting to them in, in 2014 and they wanted to grow via acquisition. So they actually wanted to, um, to, to buy accounting firms to get a certain amount of revenue because at a $12 million revenue number, that just changed the segment you know, the, the segment of the market they were in and, and therefore the, the multiplier on their revenue would be worth more and they could sell more products to their clients. And importantly, um, you know, this, uh, the, the, the 100% owner at the time was very entrepreneurial. So he mm. did have an accounting degree, but he didn't do any accounting work. And he, he employed really good accountants to do that. So he, he saw the business very entrepreneurially. And, and what we actually said to him was, well, we can actually get you to $3 million through organic growth. Um, via, you know, redeploying your time differently as opposed to just acquiring and then trying to, you know, digest it. Um, yeah. why, don't we, why don't we get you to $3 million first yeah. organically and then acquire smaller firms doing that 1.2 and showing them how to get to three. So what we, get, what we talk to our clients about is do you have a portfolio mindset? Because if you're looking to grow your firm via acquisition, well, firstly, optimize it first to its maximum level and then use that formula to buy other businesses because if two $1.2 million firms merge to create a $2.4 million firm, there's no uplift there. It's, yeah. it's a lot of work for doubling. But yeah. ultimately, you know, if you're at 60% efficiency and they're at 60% efficiency, as soon as you merge, you're at 36% 
0.6 mm. times 0.6, which is why 77% of them fail because it takes too long to integrate. Mm. Whereas if you optimise your business to three and then bring four $1.2 million firms into the mix, well, all of a sudden you've got $8 million of revenue to play with. And I use mm. the word play with um, in, a, in a deliberate way because that gives you enough upside to give you the time to bake in the integration of those other firms. So when you think about growing, it's about saying, well, let's get ourselves to a big enough point where we can still be the major player or have control or be the dominant force, but also have enough because the problem with just acquiring one firm is it's like um, if you have only add one person to your sales team and there's, you know, there's only two people in your team, you add one. If he or she fails, the cost of training, et cetera, mm. et cetera, you know, you're at risk. Whereas if you hire four salespeople on commission, and two of them work, well, you'll get the uplift and you'll get another million dollars in revenue. So it's the same when acquiring a firm. Those four businesses doing 1.2 million, if two of them work and we get them to three, well, we've got a successful transaction and a Mm. successful acquisition strategy. If we don't have enough, because two might fail, you know, that's why we need to get coverage and to de-risk it. So, and managing the acquisition of four firms is almost the same amount of work as managing the acquisition of one or two. Yeah. It's, it's the same with restaurant formulas. One restaurant, four restaurants or 12, you make money. With two or three restaurants, you lose money because you've got too much you know, running around doing everything and not enough mm. revenue. So when looking to grow via acquisition, often we sit there and say, well, let's optimise it first to get big enough and then bring smaller businesses in where they can actually see that up with because that acquiring business that is at 1.2, if you can show them how to get to 2.4, well, there's enough share price growth for all the participants mm. as opposed to, you know, because one of the risks when acquiring is the, the company you're acquiring, you know, the, the cultural view is often, well, we're now acquiring you, you've got to, you know, it's my way or the highway, which, is, which ultimately leads to, to mistakes. As another example, at, at the other end, um, an old client of ours, um, that's an accounting firm, merged with another accounting firm. They were both $4 million firms at the time. Mm. And the two owners, one of the firms, one of the owners had retired and the same thing had happened with the other firm. There was two owners and one had retired. So the two r- residual owners of each firm sat down and said, okay, well, let's merge together. And they were both in the local market on the northern beaches of Sydney and they actually designed a three-year integration strategy. And they said to all their employees and all their clients, this is going to take three years to integrate. And what that did was it took the pressure off everything. That's because fascinating. It, Not many people were willing to take that amount of time, right? <laughs> yeah, but that's the key thing. Right? That's why you know only one in four are successful yeah. because you've actually got to deal with the reality of the situation, mm. which is you know there's the cultural integration things and it's just like building a house or building a road you know things take twice as long and cost twice as much so one of our rules when looking for acquiring is uh, halve the assumptions in your revenue projections and double the time it's Mm. going to take And it's interesting that you're mentioning all of this. I've spoken to um, many accounting practices on this um, in this podcast, and I'm just thinking at the moment of one, um, Ed Chan from Chan and Naylor talked about the acquisitions that they make and how they've now got um, a strategy where they'll acquire, but then they'll sit the business exactly as it was for 12 months, and only after 12 months will they start to um, properly integrate. And Mm -hmm. I thought, what a great approach is that? Because when I reflect on many of the transactions that I can see have have had issues after completion in in the Mm -hmm. integration phase, Mm -hmm. generally it does always come back to moving too fast or or not having some of these parameters, understanding what success Mm -hmm. is and all those things. But Mm -hmm. it's interesting that you talk about speed. Uh, That certainly reflects in what I've seen. And the reason why people move too fast, in inverted commas, is because when they do the spreadsheets, they go, well, we've got 18 months to make this work and we need to get our return and cost of capital because ultimately, you know, if you've got a million dollars, you could get 11% in the property market, you know, 14% in the equity markets, et cetera, et cetera. So Mm. it is kind of reverse engineered against deployment of capital and those sorts of things. But, you know, the the case study you mentioned of Chan and Ayo, like that's fantastic to hear that. Because, mm. you know, keeping people in situ, again, just like, you know, the, the um, Northern Beaches merger that I was talking about, you know, that three-year time frame, it gave everyone the time and they actually got there ahead of that 
um, and they'd you know they spent the majority of their energy on integrating their culture mm. because that was the key. Because you know, as soon as people are sticky to the business and the new business, you know that works really well. So you know, it, it's the capital component, and and when a you know, when I hear a case study of someone just saying, "Well, let's just stay where you are for a year," like you know, that's music to my ears. And you know, in a in a in a larger, well-known, um, I suppose, merger. You know, when Price Waterhouse merged with Coopers and Lie brand mm. twenty years ago, now um, we were coaching PwC on the west coast of the United States. And when I first started coaching them, all the partners would introduce themselves as, "You know, I'm Bill Smith." I'm XCNL. I'm John Smith. I'm XPW, and, <laughs> and, I, and I was kind of coached them in this room at uh, in this in this beautiful um, boardroom in LA, um, you know, overlooking the whole city. And I'm sitting there going, "That's not going to work, guys." You know, you, you have to introduce yourself as PWC. But then I got in the lift with someone who was a, a junior, a, a graduate accountant, uh, and I said, no, "And we're just chatting." I said, "Well, you know." Which one are you from, PW, you know, PW or CNL? And they looked at me and said, neither. I've just joined PWC. And I, so I kind of thought, okay, there is hope because the, the juniors haven't been inculcated with all the, the old, the, the old drives, the old, you know, the old state solution. So you know that, um, you know, so there was hope, and you know, now, you know, twenty years later. You know, no one mentions where they were from originally, but yeah, yeah. Ultimately, you have to get that. You know, we were from this side of the camp. Eventually, out. Yeah, yeah. And and new people joining, and and one of the you know the key KPIs should be staff turnover. You know, one of the most important things to focus on is retention of staff. Yeah, right. Buyer culture and giving that time because if you retain staff, you'll retain clients because as soon as there's staff turnover, you know the cost of um, a, a key staff member leaving is twice their salary. So one mm. of the great Gartner studies was if you have $125,000 a year staff member, the cost to them of your business of leaving is $250,000 that year. So mm. if you're a business of 20 people and four staff leave, you know, it's almost, a, you know, it's, it's a significant, um, you know, impact on the business. So working on retaining staff, but then also acquiring new staff who don't have any, you know, we don't have any history, so to speak, in that Coopers and Lie brand and PW example means that the you know the new firm or the new company just is that new company. And you know, again, right now at PwC, you know, there's a huge majority of people out there that don't know it was you know Coopers and Lie brand and PW twenty years ago. Our accountants mm. on the call will obviously know that, but mm. same with you know and you know Deloitte. Um, you know, so you know, EY used to be Arthur Young and Ernst and Winnie, I think, from memory back in the day. So you know, then they merged, etc. So you know, that retention of staff, but attraction of new staff, uh, is key. But yeah, the, the time, you know, focusing on culture and giving everyone enough time to make it work. Because as soon as you mm. put an artificial time limit on human beings, we don't respond well under pressure. Mm, mm. As, as you say, the, this accounting practice had a timeline, but but it was far enough into the future that it didn't create the anxiety yeah. that and it actually worked in their advantage because everyone, oh, we'll, get, we'll be able to coast this in, yeah, and yeah. we're good. And so by taking the pressure off, they naturally integrated much more quickly, and they were actually able to bring forward. But if they'd said we need to do this in two years, it wouldn't have worked. Okay, fabulous, Mark. Well, look, I just want to thank you so much for coming here to talk about why um, three quarters of acquisitions fail. And I'm looking forward to you coming back for part two on how we make it a success and what to look for when acquiring. So, um, but Mark, if any of our listeners want to make contact with you, how do they go about doing that? Uh, info, I-N-F-O, at Sherlaw's Group dot com s h i r l a w s g r o u p dot com excellent and of course as always we'll put links to that in our show notes and on our website mark absolutely loved it i'm really looking forward to having you back for part two yeah thanks for having me 
Well, that's it for part one of our two-part series all about acquisitions for growth. And of course, in this episode, we talked about why it is that you might acquire for growth if three out of four acquisitions fail. And I'd love you to come back to our next episode, which is also with Mark, where we dig into why is it that if three out of four acquisitions fail, you would still want to decide to go down the path of an acquisition? How do you become the one out of four that makes the acquisition a rip-roaring success? So in our next episode, that's what Mark and I dig into. But for now, if you would like like more information about what Mark and I were speaking about today, or in fact, if you'd like to download a transcript, then all you have to do is head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com or check out the show notes of this podcast on your podcast player. There you'll be able to find out how to contact Mark Johnston at Sherlaw's Group if you would like some assistance in getting yourself ready for the strategy of an acquisition. There you'll also be able to find out details of how to contact our legal eagles at Aspect Legal if you or your clients are looking at building up for an acquisition for growth or indeed if you're looking at building for exit and want to understand the best way from a legal perspective to approach this. Well, look, I hope you enjoyed this episode and make sure you hit subscribe on your favorite podcast player so you can come back and join us in part two, which is the more upbeat part of this two-part series where we talk about what to do to make your acquisitions a success rather than this uh, statistic of the three in four failures in acquisitions. All right. Well, look, thanks again for listening here at the Deal Room podcast. You have, of course, been listening to Joanna Oki and our podcast has been very proudly brought to us by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. See you next time. Aspect Legal has a number of great services that help businesses prepare for a sale or acquisition to help them prepare in advance and to get transaction ready. We've also got a range of services to help guide businesses through the sale and acquisitions process. We work with clients both big and small and have different types of services depending on size and complexity. We provide a free consultation to discuss your proposed sale or acquisition. So see our show notes on how to book a time to speak with us or head over to our website at aspectlegal.com.au. Ladies and gentlemen, that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Thanks for listening to The Deal Room Podcast. To find out more about this episode and other episodes in the series, check out the show notes or head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com.au.